Thank you to the worship team for preparing those songs this morning. Great to have musical support in the summertime. It's wonderful. Our scripture this morning is Romans chapter 8. And if you would open your Bible, crack it open. There might be cobwebs on it, I don't know. But crack it open and uh, find Romans chapter 8. I think you better have a look at this. It's the Word of God. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may share also in his glory. Amen. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, The spirit you received brought about your adoption. I think adoption is such a beautiful, grace-filled sort of thing. We sat in the courtroom listening to the words of the judge as our grandson, Luke, was adopted into our family. And Luke has been a wonderful blessing to us. We couldn't love him any more than we do. He's a fantastic kid. But even more amazing than adoption into a human family is the concept of spiritual adoption that Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 8 in these verses that I read where the Apostle says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption. So if you have your Bible open, take a look again at these verses in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, my Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are, 
the children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. It's about inheriting something, co-heirs with Christ. The Bill Gaither song says, joint heirs with Jesus. Well, how does that happen? Sounds like a good thing to me. How does it happen? It happens when we are adopted into the family of God. So we're continuing our little summer series on popular beliefs that are not in the Bible. And we've looked at things like God helps those who help themselves and bad things happen to good people. And last week, cleanliness is next to godliness. Today we're going to consider another familiar thought that people sometimes have. We're all God's children. Yeah. Have you ever heard anyone say that? I'm sure you have. We're all God's children. There's a popular country singer by the name of Alan Jackson, and he sings a song called, We're All God's Children. And he says this, here comes a Baptist, here comes a Jew, there goes a Mormon and a Muslim too. I see a Buddhist and a Hindu, I see a Catholic, and I see you. We're all God's children. We are all God's children. Well, perhaps it sounds nice to say that we're all God's children. It sounds very tolerant and inclusive. It sounds very Canadian to say that we're all God's children. But it's just not true. It's a very destructive sort of lie. The truth is we are not all God's children. And to say that we are is an attempt to minimize the power of the gospel. I, I would like us to consider what the Bible actually says, which is uh, the best approach to finding out the truth. The Bible says that God is the creator. He's the creator of us all. He is the sovereign Lord of all creation. And we owe our lives, we owe our very existence to Him, all of us, every human being. God is our creator. But that is quite a different thing than saying we're all God's children. We are not all God's children because while God is the creator of us all, He is not, according to the Bible, the Father of us all. That's certainly not what Jesus taught. If you have a Bible, turn back a few pages to John chapter 8. I'd like you to look at this. Give you a second to find it. The Gospel of John, fourth book in the New Testament. John chapter 8. And find verse 37. John chapter 8, verse 37. In that verse, Jesus says to the people of Israel, who he happens to be talking to that day, he says to them, I know you are descendants of Abraham. You're Hebrews by birth and by heritage. But that doesn't make you children of God. Being racially Jewish doesn't give you any right to claim that God is your father. Here's the sort of people you are, says Jesus in that verse. John chapter 8, verse 37. He says to them, he says this to them, you're looking for a way to kill me. And you're doing this, verse 38, because you're listening to your father. Isn't that what it says? John chapter 8, verse 38, they're listening to their father, and it's not God they're listening to, because they want to kill Jesus. Well, they say to Jesus, Abraham is our father. They say that in verse 39. And Jesus says to them, if Abraham was your father, maybe you would behave like Abraham. As it is, Jesus says in verse 40, you're acting just like your father. And so the Jews try a new argument in verse 41. They say to Jesus, we are not illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself. And this is where it gets interesting. Jesus says to them in verse 42, Look at verse 42. If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? 
because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Jesus is saying these things to, to the Jewish leaders, the most religious people of his day. If you were God's children, you would think like God's children. You would be motivated as God's children. You would act like God's children. As it is, the evidence points to the fact that you are not God's children. You are, Jesus says, in point of fact, the children of Satan. So, God is the creator of all, yes, but apparently he is not the father of all. God the Father has only one begotten Son. The rest of us, if we want to become one of God's children, must be adopted into God's family, as I read in Romans chapter 8. By way of the cross, through the wonder-working power of the blood of Jesus, we can be adopted into the family of God. We can become God's children. But not everyone chooses to accept this opportunity offered to us at the cross. Some choose not to be God's children. So Alan Jackson's song is incorrect. The Mormons don't teach us how to become children of God. The Hindus don't teach us how to become children of God. Only the Bible tells us the truth that we can become children of God through Jesus Christ. Mormons and, ba and Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Hare Krishnas and Catholics and Anglicans and Baptists and Salvation Army people can all become children of God, but only through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only way to become children of God. In order for us to become children of God, we must ask God through Christ to adopt us. The first step is repentance for the sin in our lives. The next step is accepting Jesus as our Savior, accepting that what he has accomplished for us at the cross is sufficient for our salvation. And then the next step is to follow Jesus down the highway of holiness, becoming true citizens of God's kingdom, becoming the children of God, the adopted children of God. If you don't believe this or can't accept this, according to Jesus, you have no right to claim to be a child of God. The postmodern concept of religious pluralism is a lie. It's one of Satan's most effective strategies in his campaign to destroy Western civilization. To say that there are many ways to God. To say that every religion has validity and all lead to the same place. No, according to Jesus, there's only one way to God and that way is Jesus. There's only one narrow way and that one narrow way is Jesus. The goal of religious pluralism is to divert us from the narrow gate that leads to salvation, to divert us from Jesus, who is the narrow gate, and to offer us alternatives, the broad road that Jesus talked about that leads only to eternal damnation. That's an easy way, and we're so easily distracted and diverted down that wide road to destruction by the seductive power of the media, and by social media, and by peer pressure, and by the empty promises of a godless society that are teaching all us polite Canadians to be so tolerant 
because we're all God's children, right? No, says Jesus. Jesus says if we want to become the children of God, Jesus is the way, the only way. It's Jesus or nothing. Jesus or eternal death. Pluralism, societal tolerance and inclusivity, political correctness, anything that denies that Jesus is the only way means death for us. Progressivism, socialism, Hinduism, Buddhism, communism, Marxism, atheism, they all have as their central theme pluralism. Don't mess around with this so-called liberal and enlightened thinking. It leads to spiritual death. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Enter through the narrow gate. It's, it's the only gate that leads to life, and Jesus is that narrow gate. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's clear. Jesus wasn't trying to make eternal life difficult for us. He was trying to make it possible for us. He says to us, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus made the road to eternal life possible for us. But not everyone will find it. The doctrine of universal salvation, that in the end, everyone will be saved, this is heresy. Some of the big mega churches are into this. Don't worry. In the end, everyone will be saved. No. In the end, everyone will not be saved. Only the children of God have any hope of salvation. And clearly, we are not all God's children. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, promises us, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? So by logical extension, there has to be an opposite truth here. If there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, then sadly, there is condemnation for those who are not in Christ Jesus. If we're all God's children, if everyone is a child of God, if simply being born makes me a child of God, then why would Jesus have bothered to get up in the middle of the night and seek out Nicodemus to talk to him about the necessity of being born again? Did Jesus lie to Nicodemus when he said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God? If merely being alive makes me a child of God, for what possible reason would God so love the world that he would bother to give his only son to die on the cross. If God loves everybody, and in the end everybody's going to be saved, and everybody's going to go to heaven, then why did Jesus say that he was the only way, and that he is the narrow gate that only a few are going to find, implying that most people are going to hell? If we're all de facto, God's children, simply by existing, what do we need Jesus for? If we're all God's children, Jesus is a lie, and the Bible is a lie, and this church is a lie, and our band might as well go and find a circus to play at. These people who advocate that we're all God's children are confusing being human with being saved. All of humanity has been created in the image of God. Yes, all of humanity has been created in the image of God. And as such, every human being is a candidate for salvation. Jesus died to make salvation possible for everyone. 
Every person is of infinite value to God. Every person is loved by God. But that fact doesn't save anybody. God loved everybody long before Jesus came to die for us. He does love us. He made us. But the incarnation and the life and teaching of Jesus and the death and resurrection of Jesus weren't random, pointless actions. Jesus came here to live on our planet and to die for us because even though God has loved us since before the creation of the world, we still need a Savior because our sin had cut us off from fellowship with the God who loves us. There's nothing more unbiblical than the idea that just because I'm alive and I'm loved by God, I'm saved and I'm bound for heaven. If that were true, if it's true that we're all God's children, there would be no need for evangelism, no need to repent of our sins, no need to worry about living a proper Christian life, no need to spend any time in prayer, but according to the Bible, clearly everybody is not a child of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 tells us, crystal clear, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. And there's only one way to become children of God, and that way is being adopted into God's family through Jesus our Savior. If you're a child of God today, if you're in the family of God today, you'll want to join me in giving thanks to the Lord for our adoption into his family. So for our response to the message today, what I'd like us to do, I would like us to stand. And let's sing together with some confidence and some assurance. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Are you? Let's be happy. It's an amazing thing. A miracle of grace. Let's sing it together.